Welcome to the National Geographic Sea Lion and welcome to Southeast Alaska. We are on board. We've got a week ahead of us of adventure and exploration in one of the most remarkable places in the world. Good morning. Last night we cruised Peril Strait from Sitka and uh, parts of Peril Strait and ended up in Rodman Bay. It's uh, currently 6.15 here on the bridge. Probably in about 30, 40 minutes we're going to uh, light off our main engines and uh, prepare to get underway. So what we have on the National Geographic Sea Line is we have, uh, for our main propulsion, we have two uh, Detroit diesel engines. Uh, basically, they are 805 horsepower each and will propel us probably at a speed of about 10 to 11 knots. We just came out of Rodman Bay where we were anchored overnight and we're cruising uh, east on Peril Strait. Soon we'll be turning north into Chatham Strait up to our afternoon destination, which is Pavlov Harbor for some activities, probably kayaking and some, uh, some hiking this afternoon. So it'll take us, uh, it's about 45 miles from here, four and a half hours basically to get up there and hopefully we'll find some wildlife on the way. So uh, we'll probably be there right after lunch. Here on the very first morning of our voyage, we find ourselves cruising through Chatham Strait. We're coming north, just out of Peril Strait, and we're looking for wildlife. Which side? And this morning, we believe that he's feeding on a krill layer that sits between the surface of the water and about 100 feet deep. The way we know what this whale is after uh, is, can be figured out here on our fathometer. If you look here at the very surface of the water, you can see that really dark red band. Or in this case, we know that we're looking through krill on their way down uh, to the depths. So this whale goes down and he blows that nice big bubble ring and gathers all of that krill into a really nice circle so that when he comes up with a nice big open mouth like we've been seeing here this morning, uh, he gets the best mouthful of food that he could possibly get. On a couple of these approaches to the whale, uh, I'm sure most of you will remember that he's come up extremely close to the ship. And on most of those occasions, we've been backing away from the whale, trying to give him room to continue his feeding behavior and enjoy his, his morning out here of breakfast. But what we've actually found is that that whale is now migrating towards the ship and blowing his bubble ring underneath the bow so that the bubble ring stops everything from going out to the sides and as the ship sits there, it's more or less the lid on his bowl and keeps all of that food from just bubbling up and over and spilling out. So he's actually coming to the ship now using us uh, to continue his feeding habits and behaviors, which is a pretty special treat for us on board the sea line. Now, I've not First seen a whale, whale ever, actually. actually. I've, not seen I've only seen him still in pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shaylin and I'm the Undersea Specialist and I'm here to explore some really unique tools of discovery here on the National Geographic Sea Lion. We have a microscope that we can use to study the plankton species throughout the different water columns of the waters we're traveling and I have a really cool underwater camera that I'll take with me scuba diving and I'll get some really nice shots of the different invertebrates and fish and all the species that we see underwater to bring them back to show you and to help you understand and get excited about um, the beautiful underwater world. Pavlov is my favorite dive site here in southeast Alaska. Most of the area is a shallow sloping sandy bottom, so if somebody just looks into the water, they wouldn't see much. But the spot where we dive and we know where to go, we have to make sure we hit it every time. There's a very steep rock cliff face and we can find all sorts of species there, so different sculpins and soles and tons of different sea stars. Thank <laughs> you. 
So if you look out over the bow, you might think the water is really dark and dreary and that maybe nothing is living down there. But that's not true. The waters in southeast Alaska are actually incredibly productive. The waters in Alaska are about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty cold. So we can dissolve a lot of oxygen in the water here. All of the dissolved oxygen feeds the plankton species, the little guys we saw in the microscope. And the, from there, the plankton can be eaten by the krill and other invertebrates and it goes up the food chain from there, feeding the whales and the larger marine mammals. Well, welcome to Pavlov Harbor. Does um, anyone know what island we're on? We're on the sea of the ABC. We are on Chichikov Island. We are in the Tongass National Forest. The entire length of the Inside Passage is this national forest, which is 17 million acres big. So this fish ladder was put in in 1935 by the CCC. These fish have historically always jumped up, up this waterfall, but they wanted to help um, enhance the salmon stock, so they put the ladder in in the 30s. You are now in a temperate rainforest. Temperate rainforests are quite unique in that they're really not found in very many places in the world. And then in Alaska, start at the southern border and stretches for a thousand miles. It's a thousand mile long coastal arc all the way to Kodiak. Tongass National Forest that we're in is the largest intact stand of temperate rainforest in the world. Um, again, it is the entirety of Southeast Alaska is this temperate rainforest, and it's really what makes this trip, this part of the state, so unique. The rest of Alaska is not like this. Killer whales, orcas. <laughs> Good morning, you guys. I'm Jeff. Today we're in a really beautiful place. It's called the Indian Islands, and it's a very narrow channel. And then behind us is Icy Strait. This is our first good look at stellar sea lions. You can see that they have these really large front oar flippers, and so they'll be able to, you know, push themselves up on that. And the big difference between seals and sea lions. Whereas seals are mainly evolved for water, these guys are also evolved for land. These are some pretty big guys. These are, uh, they're actually the largest of all the sea lions. Uh, males can grow up to 2,400 pounds. The numbers have decreased pretty significantly um, farther out north around the Aleutian Islands, mainly because of overfishing. We've eaten a lot of their food. We've emptied, you know, 90% of the ocean, and so a lot of animals are finding it much harder to make a living. But these guys here locally in Southeast Alaska are actually doing pretty well. Their numbers are actually increasing. Oh, there it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sea otter. We have a sea otter right here at 12 o'clock. So sea otters are the largest members of the weasel family. And so, whereas most of the other marine mammals that we're familiar with, they all have blubber, they all have you know, a thick layer of fat for insulation, these guys don't have any fat. They're insulated just with their fur alone, which is why they were so prized by fur traders. So their fur is so dense, it is about between uh, 640,000, maybe as much as a million hairs per square inch. Really, really dense.
Welcome, you guys. It's a beautiful rainy afternoon in uh, southeast Alaska. We're on George Island right now, which is, we're still among the Indian Islands, a group of small islands where we were this morning. And uh, we had some typical southeast Alaska weather for not long ago. All of this was clear cut. And so this is very characteristic of when you're, you're starting fresh. The forest is very homogenous. Everything looks identical. Historically, it's also interesting. Uh, here in 1942, uh, around July, the United States decided to have quite a, a strong military presence right here. So they had probably about 20 different troops stationed here on George Island. The purpose of this gun was to be able to hold down this area, you know, as a, as a main entrance into, you know, this is protecting the entrance into Icy Straits, so they did want to keep this whole area protected. But there were probably about 20 guys around here. This would have been probably an ammunition bunker. And then they had three other anti-aircraft guns that were all uh, you know, spaced out around here as well. In Southeast Alaska, we have kelp forest ecosystems, so it differs from the coral reef ecosystems that you might see in the tropics. And when people think of productivity of the ocean, they associate that with coral reefs and you see all the fish swimming around. But that's not true that those are more productive than the kelp forest. The kelp forests are actually incredibly productive. An important balance we have here is between the kelp forest, or the bull kelp that create the kelp forest, the otters, and the sea urchins. Sea otters are a keystone species, and so when they removed the otters because they were eating the fish, the urchins overgrew. They ate all of the kelp and killed the entire kelp forest. And at that point, there was no kelp forest to support the surrounding species. Welcome to Glacier Bay. I'm Ranger Kira and I'm here today from the National Park Service to help everyone aboard the Sea Lion enjoy their visit to Glacier Bay National Park. Glacier Bay is an enormous park and much of it is wilderness and we're seeing it today from the water which is one of the best ways to view it. Island is a hot spot for a lot of animals, especially the birds, because these seabirds that spend most of their life at sea come to South Marble Island to nest during the summer breeding season. We've seen a lot of changes in South Marble Island. If you had been here 30 years ago, the island was barren rock, and today it has some plants on it and some trees, but 30 years ago, all of the birds would have been up on North Marble Island. Today, it has an older forest on it, and we don't see much wildlife there at all. So it's one change among many that we're seeing here in Glacier. Bay. We just saw puffins. Oh, we love it. Yours, kittiwakes, glaucus wing gulls, stellar sea lions, stellar sea lions. <laughs> about the cormorants. What were the puffins doing? They were well, mating. The guy was on top of the girl and almost drowned her. <laughs> Just to the big, right. big dark shrub that's all the way on the left. If you go over to the right, like maybe 20 feet, she's climbing up the rock face. Okay. We were, we were following this nice lady to my right, discovered the goats, and we saw one, two, three working their way up a seam, and then all of a sudden she said, I, I see a coastal brown Alaskan bear. So we saw the mom, and then three cubs following the mom zigzagging up, and then the goats all of a sudden could hear and smell the bear, and they just took really fast going to the from left to right away from the, the grizzlies. I mean, they were at a safe distance, but they definitely could pick up on each other's scent and, and movement. It was really cool. If you're 
interested in horned puffins yeah. ahead of us? I see two right now. They have that white belly and the bright yes. beak. One of the things that's unique about Glacier Bay National Park, different than other national parks here, is that most of our visitors come by boat. The glaciers that are in the area here have surged forward and filled the bay with ice at least four times that we know of, and the most recent time was fairly recently, just 250 years ago in the late 1700s. Today, the glaciers have slowly retreated back to the point that we see them today, and we are able to trace the footsteps of their journey as we made our way back to Johns Hopkins Glacier. Today, Johns Hopkins Glacier was our main event, our big highlight here at the park. We spent a half hour in front of the glacier watching this beautiful tidewater glacier as pieces of ice fell off, calving into the water. One of the unique things about Johns Hopkins Glacier that makes it so special here in Glacier Bay National Park as well as the rest of the world is that this is one of the few glaciers that is still getting larger. Most of our glaciers in the world because of global climate change and a slight increase in temperatures are not getting enough snow to sustain them and add mass each year. Johns Hopkins Glacier forms in some of our highest coastal range mountains here. Some of them are over 12,000 feet high. Each year they're getting enough snow to compensate for what falls off the front and is lost from melting. So Johns Hopkins Glacier is one of the few glaciers that's getting larger right now, one of the few advancing glaciers. All right, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, way. So we're gonna do the plankton tow, like I said. And when we get back on the ship, I'll explain plankton a little bit more. We'll have a short presentation so then you understand more about what we're doing. But in short, we're just going to try to catch some little species, some little animals in the water. And so we're going to tow this. We're going to throw it behind the boat and try to catch something. So we just tow it for a few minutes and let us collect whatever we collect. We don't know. Sometimes there's not very much in the water and sometimes there's a lot. But that's nature, right? Our young explorers were wonderful help. Thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, so where can we find plankton? Everywhere. Pretty much anywhere. They're in fresh water, salt water, or they're in ground water. Plankton are all over the place. And all of the major animal phyla and most of the minor animal phyla are represented in the plankton at some time in their life. So this is Pond Island. It is an island at high tide. And this is a bushwhacking trip. So we're gonna be following some bear trails That's a beautiful fungus. This is a shell fungus. You are right, Poppy. These shell fungi begin to feed on, whether on Sitka or Hemlock, as soon as they begin to show any signs of dying. Basically what fungi do is they're, of course, recycling all of the elements that are in the tree. They're putting them back into the ground for the next generation of plants. Fungi are more closely related to, to us, to mammals, than fungi are related to plants. Theria made a decision a long time ago to primarily predate on proteins, and the fungi predate on cellulose and plant matter. So they said, hey, there's a niche out there I can fill, and so the fungi are essential to life moving from the ocean on the land.
white flower that you see here is um, Achillea yarrow. Any of you ever had yarrow tea? It's very good for sore throats. If you're just starting to come down with a cold, the Native Americans were the first to use it. The Mormons used it also. Thank you for whoever pointed it out. Yeah, it's gooey. Yeah, yuck. Would you like to kiss him? <laughs> Welcome to Ideal Cove. It's a beautiful misty day here in the temperate rainforest on Midcalf Island. So this is um, an edible right here, this long leaf plant. This is called um, goose tongue. It's pretty good. It'd be really good with a shot of tequila because it's super mm. salty. I'm not sure with tequila. That just tastes like the salt water I drank yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in the salad this morning, right? <laughs> there you oh. go. Hey, yeah. you're ready to go. Yeah. Have to grow some in the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> is this your first slug? Yep. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with some pretty juicy content here. These this animal here has more teeth than a shark. Banana slugs are hermaphrodites. We have a really pretty lichen here, this green one with the white dots. This is one of my favorites for just name alone. This is called Fairy Puke, <laughs> one you'll never forget. <laughs> lichens are super sensitive to air pollution. Uh, we have an abundance of lichens in Alaska so we really don't have any big industry here. There was something that happened when Chernobyl happened, which, so what happened with that, you had all this radioactive air, what is it, cesium-136? It carried over into the uh, Scandinavian countries and the lichens absorbed it. And that whole reindeer herd became radioactive. And so they had to cull that herd because of the radioactivity. So it just goes to show food chain and sensitivity of pollutants, you know, plants and pollutants. And so they actually use lichens to study uh, air quality. women than when I came here 40 years ago. It used to be that if you had a woman on a boat, you jinxed the boat. Oh, so kind of like having like bananas on board when it, you're going fishing. Exactly, and you're not supposed to leave port on Friday, right. and you can't have a pot of plant on board, and you know, all that stuff. There's the same fishery, the gillnet fishery, the troll fishery, and they're all kind of divided up. And right now, we're just getting into the height of the season. These bigger vessels, they're called SANE vessels, S-E-I-N-E. -E. They're targeting, most of them are targeting pink salmon. So the pink are schooling fish, and on a really good set, you maybe get 35 or 40,000 pounds. 
of, of fish, 35 or 40, if it's a good set. If it's a bad set, you get zip. The sets where you get no fish is called a water hall. Uh, <laughs> same vessels by regulation can be no longer than 58 feet. So to compensate for the length limitations, they go wide. Every single vessel is its own business, small business. So um, none of these vessels are owned by the processors. Uh, so that keeps the, the money spread out really well. I can't believe it out here because they're they're going right and left. I mean, pick your choice. <laughs> this is fabulous. Just unbelievable out here. So far, six. I counted eight, but they're everywhere. So. Seven. I so far, we have six. So we are in the, in the thick of it, starting to feel the temperature dropping. Rule of geologic mapping is that the area you're located is always on the corner of two maps, so you can't just, it's uh, Murphy's Law. We have come down the Endicott Arm. We are into the Dawes Glacier. Dawes Glacier is one of four tidewater glaciers that are coming out of this enormous ice field up here. If you look around, all these valleys coming in are perfect examples of the classic U-shaped valley. Virtually everything that's rounded in here was under ice about, well, recently probably is about 7,000 years ago, but the maximum was about 20,000. That was the last major advice, advance, excuse me. Everybody up for a taste of four or five hundred year old ice? You gotta lick it now. Come on, don't be. A... How often do you get to lick five hundred year old ice? Tastes like guys. We have had a remarkable journey this week on the National Geographic Sea Lion. We have gone into inlets, sailed down fjords, walked through temperate rainforest, followed bear trails, 
seen ice fall. It is just an amazing place and we've had an amazing week. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have and we certainly hope that you come back to visit us again.